Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to Sharon and indeed the, the Secretariat of the Citizens' Assembly who've been working very hard to bring you all together and uh, for this, um, I suppose, um, process of deliberative democracy. And it struck me, I was thinking about this this morning, that a healthy democracy is not something we should take for granted and particularly in, over the last um, couple of years where it seems to have been this rise in extreme um, voices and extreme views. Um, and it also strikes me that, you know, something like today really is a sign that, uh, you know, we're serious about our democracy in Ireland. And I think we all, as a citizen, um, myself, and to see you all here as citizens, it's, it's really great. Um, and I suppose no democracy is as uh, a democracy is only as strong as uh, its citizens are empowered and uh, knowledgeable, and that's why I suppose it's great to see everybody here today, and it gives me kind of great faith uh, in, in our democracy. But I'm here to talk about something that we shouldn't, uh, another thing that we shouldn't take for granted, and that's the, the future stability uh, of the, the, climate, um, the climate that we all uh, enjoy. And um, so I wanted to start off just by uh, underlining this point, which I'm sure you've heard already, that we are in an unprecedented um, time where global temperatures have already increased by approximately one degree Celsius on pre-industrial levels. And um, the, we know that in all likelihood, uh, with 95% confidence level, that it's human uh, greenhouse gas emissions which are driving this, this changing climate. And I think it's also very striking that the level of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere at this point in time is now higher than at any time in the past 800,000 years. And as you know, us humans haven't been around for 800,000 years. So that's something that's uh, it's quite uh, worrying and concerning, and it underlines the, 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 the potentially urgent uh, situation that we're in. Um, and we already know that, these, uh, that this climate change we've already experienced is uh, having impacts in Ireland, and I won't talk too much about that because there's a lot of people here who are better placed to talk about that than me. But what I would like to very briefly say is that although we are experiencing these impacts in Ireland, uh, we're, a very, we're a very resilient country, we're economically resilient, we're institutionally resilient, uh, whereas uh, impacts that are happening in developing countries, they're happening in places where that resilience isn't uh, as evident. And very small changes in the climate can have very profound and destabilizing impacts in these countries. But as Laura said, you know, even impacts that are having in developing countries, we're not insulated from those because we are all connected. And uh, a lot of the, the impacts, we'll say changing rainfall patterns, have been connected to conflicts in the Middle East, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, those, those are things that, when we talk about climate impacts, sometimes we forget about the kind of potentially destabilizing impacts from uh, events elsewhere that, that will have an impact on Europe and indeed Ireland. But I suppose what this underlines also is the principle of climate justice. Excuse me. And uh, as Laura said, it's quite a tragic one of the tragedies of climate change that the impacts uh, are, are the impacts are going to affect those countries which have done least to cause uh, the climate problem. And while there will be impacts in comparatively resilient countries like Ireland, they will not be as profound or immediate or as severe as the impacts in the countries that have done least to cause climate change. And I know Trocra, for example, released a report, which I saw reported in the media, that Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions per capita are only something like one thirty-third of those in some countries in Africa, like Malawi, for example. Um, and Ireland is far from the highest greenhouse gas uh, emitter on a per capita basis. Other countries such as the US have far higher greenhouse gas emissions per capita. But what this, is, as I said, this um, underlines is the principle of climate justice and how important that is. And when the countries of the world came together in 1992 to do something about climate change, this idea of climate justice was at the very heart of uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, as it's called. And it was encapsulated in this idea of common but differentiated responsibilities. Yes, we all are responsible. Every country working together must do something about this. But the wealthiest countries who have done the most to cause the problem and who have the most resources to do something about it, they must take the lead and they must do something first. And the latest iteration of this ongoing international negotiation was the Paris Climate Change Agreement. And under this agreement, all of the countries of the world agreed that they would limit the increase in temperatures 
to at most two degrees Celsius, but they would make efforts to reduce, uh, to keep the increase in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees. And as we've seen, we've already, we've already reached one degree, so there's only very little space left there to achieve this 1.5 degree target. But I would encourage you to see this process. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. The future is uncertain. No matter how good our science, no matter how developed our understanding, no matter how good our climate models, there's always uncertainty. And I think what the Paris Agreement is, and what dealing with climate change is, is a process of risk management. We don't know what the future is going to be, but we need to manage that risk. And the way you manage that risk is obviously by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also by adapting to climate change and building resilience, be that social resilience, be that physical resilience, to the impacts of climate change which science tells us are coming. Now, before moving on to what the impacts of these targets are for Ireland, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things I hear from talking to people, to be honest, you know, people in very senior positions, people in media, people in politics, people in the administrative system. And these are the kinds of messages I get on climate change. The first one is the first question that I was asked twice. The last two times I was on the radio, this was the very first question I was asked. Well, oh, China is doing nothing. For a start, China is doing a lot. Second of all, it's the leading investor in renewable technologies globally, for example. It's doing a lot of other things as well. I, can't, I don't have time to go into it. But when I've explained this principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, yes, China has a responsibility, but it doesn't have the same responsibility as the long-developed countries uh, such as Ireland or the US. So we can't look to China to lead on this issue necessarily. That's the responsibility of rich countries like Ireland. Ireland is only a small country. It can't, whatever it does can't make a difference. Actually, if you look at the actions of small countries like Denmark or Sweden, they have brought forward and developed and deployed these new technologies which are having a profound influence on decarbonization. Winter turbines were developed in Denmark, air source heat pumps were developed in Sweden. Small countries can have a very big impact. Ireland is too poor or Ireland is too rich. I've heard both of these arguments. What I'm saying is there's always going to be an excuse for not taking action. There's always going to be an excuse for long fingering climate change. There's never a perfect time to act. So, you know, I really think that we need to act now. This may look a little bit familiar to you, so I won't <laughs> go through that. Thank you, Laura, for stealing my thunder. Um, <laughs> It just shows you all those climate change people, we probably speak to each other too much, so it's great to get out to speak to uh, people who are not necessarily dealing with climate change all the time. I won't go through all of these targets, but I just want to make one point. Um, in the paper I wrote, I explained that Ireland is not on target to meet any of its international commitments that arise from this UN and EU process on climate change. And when I say that, you might think, well, maybe no country in the EU is on track to meet its commitments. But in fact, all of the other countries are on track, with the exception of one or two countries, to meet their emissions targets and to meet their renewables targets. So really, Ireland needs to kind of pick up its socks here. It needs to do a lot more in terms of dealing with this challenge. Um, and just, I don't like to think about this in terms of financial uh, repercussions, because I think that there's, like, as Laura said, these are the kind of things we should be doing anyway. Cleaner, greener cities, healthier, warmer homes, um, more, um, you know, uh, more renewable and less polluting energy systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there is a financial implication for not meeting our commitments. These are legally binding targets that we've entered into. And it's very difficult to estimate the costs of non-compliance, but they will certainly be in the hundreds of millions by 2020 and potentially in the billions by 2030 if we continue on the pathway we're on at the moment. That's less money for hospitals, for schools, for roads, or for whatever you know, your, your pet uh, government project is yourself. Um, and this kind of negative scenario that I've painted, I want to emphasize that this is the best case scenario for Ireland. Right now, the economy is growing faster than we have integrated into our, green, into our emissions projections. The dairy herd is expanding much faster than was integrated into our greenhouse gas emissions projections. So the situation is actually worse. Um, okay, not worse, because these are good things in their own right. Economic growth is a good thing. Job creation is a good thing. But the, these other implications are not being considered, are not being mainstreamed. Um, into, these, into, into these things that are happening. And so, you know, there is, a, there is a case there that when these things are happening, we need to be very honest about the trade-offs that sometimes exist in policy, and we're not being fully honest about those trade-offs <coughs> at the moment. So the question then is, 
I've said that we're not doing well enough. The question is, why are we not doing well enough? And again, this is something that we could probably spend a whole day talking about, but very simply, I just want to look. There is the case, if you look at the bottom left here, that some of these technologies are really expensive. And some of these technologies that we need to develop have not actually been developed yet, or they're unreliable, or we don't trust them, like electric vehicles. So there are economic and technical problems here. But even when those economic and technical problems don't arise, for example, wind energy, it's a very cost-effective technology for Ireland. There are other problems. For example, um, the, these technologies can challenge uh, existing energy systems. They can challenge incumbents who are, we'll say, making you know, their livelihood from the existing technologies. So there's a whole range of social problems um, in terms of barriers, in terms of the way we think about these things. But also in terms of the way government is addressing this challenge, that's far from perfect. It requires coordination across a whole range of government departments. It's a really difficult problem to think about. It's a really difficult problem to solve from a purely administrative and government perspective. And all of these things feed into politics, and the politics on climate change is not good. It's the easiest issue to forget about. It's the easiest issue to long finger. It's the easiest issue to kick the touch. And I suppose these are just examples of what I was talking about in terms of uh, some of the things we need to do, and I think that there's a particular problem. There's a problem in our cities and in our countryside, but I think there's a particular problem in rural Ireland, because any time rural Ireland hears about climate change, it's pylons, it's wind turbines, it's reduced to beef herd. And so there's this very negative narrative about climate change, um, particularly in rural Ireland, but also in the cities, when people say, oh, well, you have to pay more for your fuel to get to work in the morning. But I think it's a bigger problem in rural Ireland with a lot of the things that we need to do. And I think that that's a real shame, because if you think about climate change and what it needs, what we need to do something about climate change, we need renewable resources like water, like waste from farms, like wind, like biomass, and space. You know, we need space. These are distributed technologies to power our energy system. And all of these things can be an economic opportunity for people in marginalized communities, for people who don't live in cities. And I think that it's a shame, therefore, that we have this narrative that's all about the negative and that we haven't managed to capture these positives and turn them into a positive and turn them into a driver of economic growth, a driver of progress, and a, a driver of democratization as well, because you know the kinds of solutions here are the kinds of solutions that will enhance democracy as well. Another problem, of course, in terms of dealing with climate change is we have to be very honest. There will be pain. There will be benefits. There will be winners. But there will also be losers. And that's a really difficult problem for politics to deal with. There will be growing sectors. But how do you deal with the people who are going to lose their jobs because we have to transition to a low carbon future? And there are lots of sectors where there may, may be job losses. And that's why politicians tend to sort of, we'll say, take a, the path of least resistance on this because nobody wants to go to their community and say, oh, we can't do this anymore, or whatever. But what I want to emphasize is, it's great to say, let's be a leader in climate change, but there are implications to that. There are implications for people's jobs, there are implications for people's livelihoods, and we need to be very honest about those implications, or we're never going to solve this problem. If we just say it's all about solving climate change and there's no implications and there's no costs, I don't think we're going to get anywhere as a society in terms of dealing with these issues. And I think one way that we can kind of think about it, one way we can sort of convey this narrative is to take this just transition framework, where we, put a, we agree as a society to put a much greater focus on our delivering our bit, doing our bit in terms of reducing emissions. Um, but we hear from the politicians that they agree that this is going to be conditional on a fair distribution of the costs and benefits, where there are going to be losers, where there are vulnerable communities, do we commit as a society to dealing with those, with those issues, where we introduce, for example, a carbon tax. Yes, that's going to increase the cost of fuel, that's going to particularly affect poorer communities. How do we deal with that? So any regulation, any measure we introduce, we have to think about it more in terms of the social implications. Um, and that's what a just transition framework is. And I think that that's a very useful way of thinking about uh, some of these issues that we're facing, some of these challenges. And so the last thing I would say is, oh, it's the second last thing I would say, sorry. <laughs> so I think that you know, what I'm saying here is that yes, there's a role for policy, 
and there's a role for policy in terms of designing the kinds of incentives that we're bringing forward in ways that are amenable to communities and citizens, that people can get involved in this energy transition. But we also need more empowered communities, and we need citizens that are better aware and better avail able to take the avail of the economic opportunities that will arise. So it's a top-down and a bottom-up process that we need, not one or the other. They both have to work together. Um, but I do want to sort of leave you on a slightly negative note. I know that's not what you're supposed to do. You should probably finish on a positive. But I do think that we need to be very honest about this idea of climate leadership. I think it's very fanciful, to be perfectly honest with you, to talk about climate leadership. We are not doing our fair share in this country. We have spectacularly failed to deal with this challenge over the last 15 years. And I've been involved in this issue for the last 12 years. And I can tell you that we have not stepped up to the plate. We have not dealt with this challenge effectively. So if we want to be climate leaders, what I would say to you is let's begin by doing our fair share. And then maybe we can have another citizens' assembly in 10 years' time, and we can see if we're ready to become leaders. Thank you very much.